Welcome to Lincoln House. Uh, I see a number of uh, familiar faces and some new ones. Uh, I'm Armando Carbonell. I chair the Department of Planning and Urban Forum here at the Lincoln Institute. And uh, we are interested in cities and nature and the way nature and cities work together and also in urban planning systems and in tools for planners. And in uh, particular, we've been interested in visualization and planning support systems that use uh, computer software as part of uh, the approach to making planning more effective. Uh, and of late, within the last couple of years, got interested in the concept called uh, open source and, uh, or open access, which is a, a weak version of open source. Uh, and it really comes out of our work with uh, planners who've developed some commercial software packages to assist in the planning process uh, that we thought ought to be uh, uh, enhanced and brought forward and we wanted to help them. But as an operating foundation, we could, really couldn't be helping private uh, enterprise just develop its own products uh, in ways that would be profitable to them but not uh, generally available to the public. Uh, and not, not really a public good, which is really what we're, uh, we're after here as a foundation. So we got interested in a, in a different way of enhancing these tools by making them uh, much more accessible uh, to, to anybody, to developers who might uh, contribute improvements to software, to planners who might use it, to citizens who might use it. Uh, and we've been seeing some pro uh, progress at the national level working with the Environmental Protection Agency and a number of software developers, uh, our uh, colleagues uh, at uh, Fragonasian Associates, for example, who work with us on software tools uh, in Arizona and the Superstitious Business Project, uh, and uh, some very interesting developments. Uh, the Department of Housing and Urban Development and its recent uh, regional sustainability grants gave $5 million to the University of Utah, which include uh, acquiring the Fragonese Envision software and making it open source and developing a number of applications for it that will be uh, widely available. Uh, so uh, in a short while, we've seen a considerable amount of progress in this uh, field of open source planning uh, tools. Uh, and into it uh, came Tim Stoner, uh, Loeb Fellow, Lincoln Loeb Fellow, uh, Londoner. <laughs> Uh, a person who lived in the world of uh, consulting for 15 years with Space Syntax Limited, uh, with the relationship between that company, a consulting firm, and uh, University College London, the developer of a very sophisticated uh, software uh, package that he's going to talk about, uh, and uh, found himself, you know, planner, architect, <coughs> fellow. Uh, with a company that uh, was going to almost overnight go open source and change its relationship with University College London uh, as he sat here biting his nails in Cambridge uh, back in London. So uh, with a, a, sure, a number of quick trips back and forth to make sure everything was fine, we're going to hear about uh, something uh, real the open sourcing of a very interesting uh, suite of tools that uh, Tim has been responsible for developing and using in the world. Uh, uh, and it's opening up uh, and, uh, and the process by which that happened. So we're intrigued to hear about this and learn from it. Tim Starting. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Armando, for that kind introduction. Um, I'm delighted to have this opportunity to report in on my progress as the Lincoln Loeb Fellow. And my brief for today is in two parts. Uh, the, the first is to describe my work as an architect and town planner, uh, working principally out of London at Space Syntax. And second, to speculate about the future and to make some remarks about where I think the field of planning and design is headed uh, with special reference to some of the new methods of communication and some of the new technologies that have emerged in recent years and are influencing the way we as professionals uh, enact our practice. 
I've got a fair bit of ground to cover. Uh, for those of you who count, there are 80 slides. Um, so I'm, I'm going to have to whip through them at some, some parts. Um, and then I'll be happy to, to take some questions at the end. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make reference to uh, quotations from speeches of Winston Churchill and Robert Kennedy, uh, but also the screenplay from uh, When Harry Met Sally. So I'll, uh, I should probably right now beg your indulgence and forgiveness for, for what <coughs> follows. Um, space syntax, and, and, I, and I'll, show, I'll show much more to, uh, to expand on this summary, but space syntax is at heart an evidence-based approach to planning. Uh, it has a focus on space and on spatial networks, the networks through which people move, and in which people transact. And it has a focus on the human dimension, the product of the process, if you like, of planning and design. Um, it may be best known in the United Kingdom, um, but over the last 15 years, as both a field of professional practice and academic research, it, it's grown um, at a pace. And it's the nature of that growth, the, the direction it's taken, the loosening of the ties to its mothership at University College London that interests me right now through my Lincoln Loeb Fellowship. Uh, where is it going and how might we learn to uh, more gently control it as it takes on its own life? Open sourcing the software is part of this and I'd like to, I'd like to comment on um, how I see that process uh, with this, these techniques going. Um, and I'd like to start first with what I'm calling the perils of taxonomy uh, with a problem, which is perhaps one that you're familiar <coughs> with, the, the rigid divisions that exist and that we often take for granted in both academic and professional practice uh, between the architect and the planner the landscape architect, the real estate lawyer, the urban economist, and I could go on and on and on uh, to draw distinctions perhaps between planning and management, uh, between academia and practice. And this taxonomy is something we've inherited from what you see there on the left, the 19th century attempts to classify knowledge. But I think in the attempt to to do so, we've created many problems for ourselves uh, because it seems that when humanity tries to organize its thinking, it, it puts things into boxes. Yet, I mean, boxes for the objects of the, of the natural scientists and boxes for the professional disciplines within which we work. Um, I think this works often to stifle the very necessary flow of knowledge uh, between one and the other. These work against us, against what we see when we step out into the real world, which is an emergent continuum that doesn't seem to be concerned about boxes. And it, it works especially against us when we create places that fail to deliver what they were intended to do. Take this intersection, it happens to be in the, the heart of Beijing. It, it, it's, I think, typical and representative of many of the projects that have divided and separated uh, the centers of our cities. And it comes from a nature of practice which is let the transport planners deliver the roads and let the architects deliver the buildings. And through that convenient model of separation, they'll somehow be urbanism. And yet it hasn't happened. The congestion, the division, the inequalities that flow scar the urban centers that our divided professions have created. And I know the role of planning is to mediate between scales of activity and, and between activities themselves. But again, we divide planning into so many different categories. Permissions, forward planning. Um, we seem to reinforce the separation rather than to reduce it. And Perhaps the irony of all of this is that each of these disciplines has one thing in common, which is an interest in space. 